We have the honor of having Dr. Sharish Barve. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Louisville School of Medicine, Division in Gastroenterology, Heptology and Nutrition. He is also associate director of the UofL Alcohol Research Center and director of the Heptobiology Toxicology COBRA Bioanalytical Core. He has recently established and integrated metagenomics and metabolics. I should have studied this before, Dr. Barve. Okay, great. Um, in microbial structure and functional data, which can be integrated with probiotics, interventional, and clinical outcomes research. A major component of Dr. Barve's research program focuses on acquiring fundamental knowledge about the pathogenic changes in the microbiotic gut, brain access, and applying this knowledge to reduce the burden of neurological disease, particularly his research program employs basic translational and clinical approaches aimed at developing relevant preventative and therapeutic intervention strategies to slow down cognitive decline and preserve memory function. I know I butchered that, but please help me welcome Dr. Sharish Barve. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Welcome all. I would like to thank uh, uh, the North Neuroscience Institute, particularly Dr. Shields and Dr. Cooper, for inviting me to present our ongoing work. Uh, in today's talk, my intent is to provide you with a conceptual framework that sets the tone for the gut bacteria in, 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 in your system and its connection to the brain and how these connections are significantly important for good health in the context of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Pardon? My, okay, sorry. Um, uh, neurodegenerative diseases and how we can have interventional strategies to improve the outcomes. So as the title says, Fix your gut and fix your brain, uh, which also is healthy gut, is, is healthy brain. So to begin with, I'm going to give you a background about what the gut microbiome is in all of us. So what you see here is the elementary canal, and as you go through the descending colon here, uh, you have very little bacteria in your stomach because there is high acidity, pH is about one to two, but as you go down the, the elementary canal, the numbers start increasing from the duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and then colon. And by the time you reach the colon, there are about literally trillions of bacteria. Uh, the, one of the trivia is that there are literally 10 to 15 times more bacterial cells in you as compared to your all other cells as, as human beings. So this is, this is the, the, the travel. Another very interesting information is, if you look at the total number of genes, close to a million plus genes reside in your gut microbiome, which are housed by, by the bacteria. And us, humans, have about 23,000 genes total that make, make us function. So you can see this amazing connection between the gut microbiome and your system. And as it says here, that 99% of your DNA genes are in the microbial cells and not, not human cells. So you can clearly appreciate the, the proportion and the size of this liquid organ that sits in us. And there was, at least 15, 20 years back, started, we started this realization that this system clearly has to have a role to play in both physiology, I mean health, as well as disease. And that's where the initial part of this talk is. So let's visit what are the beneficial functions of the gut microbiota that, that sits in you. First of all, they have a huge role in regulating your metabolic function. For example, fermentation of non-digestible substrates into useful products. So when you eat your greens and salads and so on, we have non-digestible fiber that's converted to some very useful potent molecules called short-chain fatty acids. And I'm going to show you some very nice data how this helps you in, in regulating, uh, preventing disease, and maintaining good health. 
bile acid bile transformation. Our system makes a lot of bile, which your liver makes. It ends up in the gut, and the right transformation, again, is hugely important for good health. Following that, your vitamin production. Some of the B-complex vitamins are produced by our gut microbiome, and then energy extraction. So there are a lot of non-digestible food elements which your healthy gut microbiome can extract energy and, and provide you with that. Most importantly, there's a protective function, and this is extremely important. Colonization resistance, which means if you have a healthy, diverse gut microbiome, when inadvertently you have uh, unfriendly bacteria or pathogenic bacteria or disease-causing bacteria going inside you, they're not allowed to get a foothold. So some people can go travel wherever, eat whatever, nothing happens. And some people can get diarrhea or you know, have, have, have issues. So having a healthy, uh, diverse microbiome is exceedingly important that offers you colonization res resistance, colonization from the bad bacteria. Then there's antimicrobial secretion. Your friendly, good, beneficial bacteria make basically molecules that are unfriendly to the disease-causing bacteria or fungi or viruses. So that's an important part. And then it's very significantly, the good bacteria or, or the, the, the proper commensal flora continuously educates your immune response. When this crosstalk breaks down, and you'll see it further, that's where inflammation, chronic inflammation, and all those issues start. And then finally, there are structural and histological functions that your gut microbiome provides you, which is epithelial cell growth and differentiation of, your, of, your, of the intestine. Uh, there is intestinal villi and crypt development, and then tight junction permeability. You must have heard the terminology of leaky gut. So if, if that has to be prevented, because that's important, otherwise you have these systems coming into the system and, and driving inflammation, um, maintaining tight junction permeability is extremely important, and the good bacteria does that. What are the components? Life overall has, has an effect, and there are some of the uh, important uh, uh, issues that, that we go through are, are listed here, uh, starting from uh, birth, infant feeding methods are important, stress, uh, exercise, uh, metabolic, psychological stress, sleep. You're going to hear from Dr. Shields following this talk how sleep is highly relevant. When, you, when your circadian rhythms change, either through, say, jet lag, international travel, whatever goes, it definitely affects your gut microbiome. Diet clearly is important, whether you are eating uh, a healthy diet with fiber and fruits versus more processed foods. Alcohol has not been shown here, but alcohol, again, beyond a certain point, can have a huge impact on the gut microbiome. Pharmaceuticals, you must have heard about polypharmacy, uh, antibiotics. So when you have things and you take antibiotics, those antibiotics not only kill the, the bacteria that is causing problems, but it also starts affecting your good bacteria. So polypharmacy is a very significant component. Geography, we have seen differences in people from Eastern Europe versus in Asia versus within the United States from deep down south up north. There are differences because of weather, of diet, and so on. And then obviously the stages or life cycle stages. Aging is known to change your microbiome as you go from infancy to middle age to, to old age. So these are some of the components that have a huge impact on a continual basis on your gut microbiome. So let's talk about bacterial dysbiosis. So this is a term you might have heard is thrown around. What that means is change from the normal commensal flora into an altered form, and that's called dysbiosis. And the dysbiosis, the very first component of dysbiosis is called reduced diversity. So we have more than 500 per species in our gut, but as, and, and they're very diverse, and you need a diverse flora. As you start contracting that diversity, that is a hallmark that your microbiome is changing, and that's not good for you, because you're going to skew now either into a, uh, where you can get an expansion of pathobiomes or bad bacteria can start proliferating, and the counterpart is you start losing the beneficial bacteria. Like I talked about, the, the, the beneficial bacteria that convert non-digestible fiber into short-chain fatty acids, extract energy, make vitamins, and so on. So this biases is a collective term, and I want to just point this out, that if you look at any disease state, from diabetes to rheumatoid arthritis to depression to alcoholic liver disease, there is this biases. But it is contextual. That means the type of dysbiosis associated with 
diabetes is not similar to what is seen with Alzheimer's. So the whole area of, of investigation is to identify very specific measures of dysbiosis in a given clinical context so we can fix it. That's the main, main uh, aspect. So as, as I just said, the, the gut dysbiosis is seen in, in multiple different disease states. You have hypothyroidism, there is in the muscle wasting, sarcopenia, rheumatoid arthritis, clearly IBD, Crohn's, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and clearly for today's talk, I'm going to focus on uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, multiple sclerosis, depression, anxiety, pain, and stress. I'm particularly going to uh, lay stress on uh, Alzheimer's, but some of the same conceptual framework that we are working on is applicable to other forms of neurodegenerative diseases. And this brings me now to the gut-brain axis. So the gut-brain axis is a bilateral communication network between the GI tract and the central nervous system. So it's a two-way highway, okay? Your gut has an influence on the brain, and, and brain can also then send signals down to the gut, like controlling motility and so on, and affect the gut microbiome. Uh, vagal nerve uh, or vagus nerve is, is very important part of this bilateral connection. So in the last few years, there has been now increasing clinical and preclinical evidence, which implicates the microbiome as a possible key susceptibility factor for neurological disorders, which include Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, autism, spectrum disorder, multiple sclerosis, and stroke. So there is increasing, again, keep in mind, the dysbiotic features that are connected with these different uh, uh, disease states, which are neurodegenerative, there are nuanced differences. And the, the, the part of the work is to understand what's relevant for Parkinson's, they may, have, they may share a lot of commonality, in fact they do, but there are some very nuanced, very specific changes that then connect with Parkinson's versus Alzheimer's, and that's what we are trying to figure out, and we have some answers right now. So this brings to the overall hypothesis of, of our work that, that we do. So as I, as I said, different forms of, of uh, lifestyle issues, uh, stress, uh, lack of sleep, as you'll hear in the next talk, antibiotics, you know, mode of delivery, and so on, can affect your microbiome in an adverse fashion. Whereas the probiotics, exercise, can also affect your microbiome, but in a, in a, in a good way. Once you have ha this disturbed microbiome that sets kind of spiraling, you have, as I talked about, loss of diversity, there could be an increase in pathobiomes or disease-causing bacteria and then loss of beneficial bacteria. Once this sets in, it affects your intestinal wall and there is an increase in intestinal permeability. You start losing the barrier function. And then the microbial products or antigens, as we call them, they start seeping into your system. So what you're seeing here is the intestinal lining that starts opening up and the microbial products start getting into your system. Once they come into your system, it drives all kinds of pathogenic events. The primary event is inflammation. And this is something that is of high value to, to uh, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say it's a smoldering fire that keeps on you know, released by the gut. And this is where your end organs are going to get stressed. In, in our context, we are, we are trying to understand and appreciate what it means to neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. And very interestingly, the same proteins that make your intestinal barrier intact are the same proteins in your blood-brain barrier. So when you see a breach in your intestinal uh, permeability, it also changes the blood-brain barrier permeability. So now your system, whatever is oozing out, is starting to affect the brain. And I'll show you some evidence for all that. And again, so once you start triggering this process in the brain, this, this is a general modus operandi that comes into play uh, and is involved in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, Huntington's disease, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So all these various different forms of neurodegenerative diseases, you are, we have no evidence to show that there's a significant change in the gut microbiome, there is significant change in the, in the system, in the molecules that are affected by the change in the gut microbiome. So it's like a dominoes effect that starts. As I told you, I'm going to focus a little bit more on, on Alzheimer's for, for today's talk. And if you take now the gut-brain connection, 
specifically in the context of Alzheimer's, what is the background? What do we know? So recent clinical research has demonstrated that in comparison to control sex and age match individuals, Alzheimer's patients have altered gut microbiome, dysbiosis, that displays distinct bacterial composition and significantly decreased diversity. So these are established facts. That's the evidence. Importantly, alterations in the gut microbial composition in Alzheimer's patients include a greater abundance of pro-inflammatory bacterial taxa and a concomitant decrease in anti-inflammatory taxa. So these things have, are now being detailed out. And that, that the reason to detail this out is with the hope to be able to fix it. So overall, the current research strongly supports the postulate that gut microbiome participates in the initiation and exacerbation of Alzheimer's disease pathology. And there's clearly more and more work being done. So I'm going to stop here. And now we want to understand when we say there's gut dysbiosis and Alzheimer's, is it a mere association? Or is the microbiome change being, playing a causal role? Now, if it's playing a causal role, it stands to reason that if we take care of it, fix it, it should have a beneficial impact and it should start reducing the severity of pathology, okay? Or prevent it or cure it, as whichever way you are in the spectrum. So I'm going to present a, a clinical trial, and there are quite a few that, that are coming up right now, is where they have looked at the effect of probiotic supplementation on cognitive function and metabolic status in Alzheimer's disease. So this was a very useful trial, and I'm going to present some of the hard evidence here. So first of all, this study was a 12-week randomized, double-blind, and controlled clinical trial. That means as patients came in, they were randomized. Half of the patients got a placebo, and half of the patients got a probiotic supplementation. And then they were compared. Because uh, for any uh, true effect, your uh, intervention should be greater than the placebo, because otherwise it's just a placebo effect. So let's review this. So the patients were randomly divided into two groups, n equal to 30, in each group treating with either milk, which was the control group, or a mixture of probiotics, again, that was in the milk, that they changed the milk composition and they included the probiotic uh, bacteria. So the probiotic supplemented group took 200 ml per day of probiotic milk containing Lactobacillus acidophilus, Lactobacillus casei, Bifidobacterium bifidum, and Lactobacillus fermentum. Now these are just names, but these bacteria are identified to be of beneficial value on all the details of their uh, gene expression, what they make is all detailed out. That's why they are included here. And they're pretty large dose, so each back type of bacteria is about 2 point, uh, 10 to the power of 9 is 2 billion of each kind were included in the milk. So when the patients got either plain milk or milk with, with these bacteria. And this uh, duration was for 12 weeks. Let's look at what, what's the end point here. So the end point is very encouraging. So after 12 weeks of intervention, compared with the control group, the, in the probiotic treated patients showed a significant improvement in the primary outcome, which was the cognitive function. And this cognitive function was assessed by the mini mental state examination score. And this is uh, a very um, important finding that the cognitive scores improved after 12 weeks in these patients. The other very important secondary outcome, because all these secondary outcomes are also important, which were change in the metabolic function of these individuals, particularly plasma malondialdehyde. It's an indicator of oxidative stress in your body. So that was reduced. Serum high sensitivity C-reactive protein, it's, it's, a, it's a marker of inflammation, it's an acute phase reactant, that came down. The HOMA IR and HOMA B, which, which reflects on ability to manage glucose, so in the pre-diabetes or diabetic conditions, those indicators will improve. And finally, serum triglycerides and quantitative insulin sensitivity check index also improved. So in this trial, the, the, the important finding was in 12 weeks, the cognitive scores improved significantly, and they also had a very beneficial impact on the metabolic outcomes. Now, uh, if I have to, um, I won't say criticism, but these are now small studies. What we need are large studies. Here, as you know, this is providing us with a proof of principle that 
changing, hopefully, the gut issues have this, and this also proves the point that there is a connection between the gut and, and the brain. So the conclusion, a little bit guarded, that probiotic supplementation demonstrates some hopeful trends that warrant further study to assess if probiotics have a clinically significant impact on the cognitive symptoms in Alzheimer's patients. So this is one of the earlier trials, uh, and as I will discuss some of our ongoing plans, we are also planning some large clinical trials based on evidence, um, uh, hopefully pretty soon in the near future. From the clinical studies, I'm going to show you some very interesting data that we have been getting from the preclinical model. It's important to do preclinical work because it allows us to do a lot more things and then translate that to, to the patients. So preclinical work gives us uh, not only proof of principle, validation of some of the concepts that we can very robustly uh, examine and then know what are the pressure points and then come back to the patients. So in this case, we are looking at the gut-brain connection by using an Alzheimer's animal model. And this animal model is extremely uh, interesting and exciting. Uh, first of all, what was the intent of the preclinical work? It was to investigate the causal role of gut dysbiosis in the development of progression of Alzheimer's disease. These are the animals that get clockwork Alzheimer's because they are made to uh, do that. And we wanted to then determine the impact of evidence-based management of gut microbial dysbiosis in the prevention and treatment of Alzheimer's disease in, in, these, in the animal model. And, and it is, as you'll see, is provide, providing us with a treasure trove of information that hopefully you can translate it into people. So this is the, the, the it's called a triple transgenic, forget the words, uh, 3XTG mouse model. And it is a triple transgenic Alzheimer mouse that expresses the mutant, these three genes that are listed here, which are human transgenes, and in the brain. And that then basically allows these mice, they recapitulate specific aspects of neuropathological progression of Alzheimer's disease, including age-dependent cognitive decline takes place. There is accumulation of plaques and neurofibrillary ta uh, tangles and age-dependent inflammation. Okay? Importantly, because of their, their phenotype, these are a valuable tool for investigating the molecular mechanisms underlying the different stages of Alzheimer's disease. Allows us to look at genes that are involved, at play, what's going on, and dissect the whole system. So very clearly, this is, this is the, the time trajectory from one month to 18 months. By 18 months, these animals all have full-blown Alzheimer's. They start some, the cognitive decline starts in the, the younger age at three months. Um, you have the amyloid plaques, uh, gliosis, starting to get neuronal tangles, and then you'll see there's a behavioral decline in these animals. So it's a very useful model to investigate your interventional uh, conceptual strategies. This is the first thing we did. We looked at their gut microbiome. As you are seeing here, that in an age-dependent fashion, from two months to 18 months, just the color coding, forget about the bacterial names, color coding tells you that the microbiome is, is shifting or, or, or age. And clearly, by 18 months, there is a significant gain of varicomicrobiota, uh, there, uh, there is a reduction in Fermicutes, and there is bacterial diota. It tells me, I won't go into details, that the microbiome where the animals start, and that happens to people also as you, as you age. So your microbiome keeps on changing. And, and this is the first uh, indicator that, and again, I just showed you the trajectory. They're also developing Alzheimer's pathogenesis as the microbiome is changing. Just a little bit detail, uh, bear with me. So what we see is that the Firmicutes phylum, which is at the beginning here, declines. The Firmicutes phylum harbors a bunch of beneficial bacteria, particularly the butyrate-producing bacteria. Now I'll show you that. And the bacteroidetes actually are increasing. So when you take a ratio between this good phyla and the bad phyla, you see a drop in the ratio. And this is a very significant telltale sign that the diversity is changing, and the gut microbiome is going through a, a significant upheaval or change. So, we then focused, I won't go into details, because of Firmicutes, we had other evidence to show that bacteria in us that make butyrate, or short-chain fatty acids, are clearly highly relevant. And if you look at that here, you can see that they have a pretty large complement of the butyrate-producing bacteria, which starts dropping with age. 
And again, I have this timeline in front of you how they, they develop through Alzheimer's pathogenesis. The color coding is, is showing you the different types of butyrate-producing bacteria. There are at least 265 known species that make butyrate for you. And again, starting from two months, there's a very significant drop or change in the butyrate-producing bacteria. So I showed you a drop in diversity, and it's showing also, when you looked at the reason that's dropping diversity, they're also losing beneficial bacteria. So very quickly, on, as a cartoon here, on the left-hand side here, this is a healthy uh, uh, section of, of, of the gut. Um, here is uh, healthy looking intestinal epithelia. There is a, a significant amount of healthy mucus layer, which doesn't allow bacteria to come in contact with the intestinal uh, epithelial cells. You have the right kind of bacteria that are going to convert, um, for example, non-digestible fiber to butrate, and all these things come into your system. And this is called lamina propria. It's a loose connective tissue that surrounds the elementary canal. And this is where most of your immune cells keep coming to slurp what's in the gut. I mean, you know the adage, you are what you eat, in a sense. So your immune response, now this is where they get either are patriots or they become terrorists, depending on what they sense from, from the gut. If you look on the right-hand side, this is a, a, a general theme that is seen in, in multiple disease states. There is clearly loss of mucus. The bacteria are now not friendly. There are more pathobionts. Not, the beneficial bacteria have gone down. There is what we call as paracellular permeability that is opening up the intestinal uh, tract and the system and the microbial products and antigens come in. And once that happens, that starts sending out inflammatory triggers. And that's a bad, bad thing to happen. So very quickly, to bring the, the, that aspect into connection with brain, I talked about short chain fatty acids. There is significant work to show that the good bacteria that make short chain fatty acids, particularly butyrate, I won't go and bore you with the details, they clearly, there is molecular evidence, biochemical, real science evidence to show that how it can influence what's going on in the brain. So, then the thought was, once we know this, how do we change this equation? And long story short, we embarked on a molecule called tributrin, which is a butyrate prodrug. And this is a triglyceride containing three butyrate moieties esterified with glycerol. It's a natural molecule and is present in a variety of foodstuffs, particularly dairy products such as butter. And it's metabolized to butyrate in the intestinal lumen by pancreatic lipases and the resident gut microflora. So we decided to give tributrin and ask the question, can we address the, the, the issues that we are seeing? And is it relevant for Alzheimer's disease progression? So I showed you this trajectory, and we started to give tributrin supplementation at six months of age to these animals. As, and obviously, there was a group of animals that did not receive tributrin oral supplementation. And let's take a quick look what happens. So first off, if you compare the 18-month animal, which has full-blown Alzheimer's, and then animals that started to get tributin at the age of six months, you're seeing a very significant change in the gut microbiome composition, as it, you can see with the color-coded uh, bar graph out here. These are all uh, measures of diversity. I won't go into the details, but clearly the Chow index, the Shannon index, S Simpson index, every aspect, we started to see a change. The Firmicutes phylum, which was down, as I showed you, came up. The Bacteroides uh, phyla that was up came down, and the ratio now increased very significantly. So it definitely told us that the tributin administration is changing the equation in the gut at the level of microbial diversity. And what you're showing here, we also asked, is it changing the equation for the butyrate-producing bacteria? And the answer is yes. This is your 18 month where the butyrate-producing bacteria have been lost to a large degree, and look at what happened to those animals that received tributrin from six months. They were able to preserve these beneficial bacteria. And these are the total butyrate-producing families, so this is where we quantify and we see a very significant change. Now the time was to go and see in the brain of these animals, or brains of these animals, to see what's going on after this. So this was very exciting. So this is two-month animal, healthy, 10 to 12 months. By 18 months, if you see these green dots, that's talking about neuroinflammation. 
There are microglia that are expressing IBA1. So there is a significant neuroinflammation. But now compared to the next slide here, which is 18 months that we given tributin, we saw that the neuroinflammation was significantly prevented, did not happen in these animals. Now, neuroinflammation is a very important driver of Alzheimer's pathogenesis. It's a driver for other forms of neurodegenerative diseases also. And what you see here is a quantification of this data, which is a very significant increase from two months to 18 months, but now compare to the same 18-month animals, but that received tributin from the age of six months. Significant cut down of neuroinflammation. This was the most exciting data in this. Uh, there's several other data points. I'm not going to show that. But you must have heard about uh, A-beta. But the most important part are the hyperphosphorylated tau uh, protein, which forms neurofibrillary tangles, which are neurotoxic. So when we gave, so these are two months. There's virtually no action. Here's your 12-month animal. Here's 18-month. You particularly focus on these yellow hyperphosphorylated tau. And when we looked at the animals that had received tributin, there was almost a complete prevention of the neurofibrillary tangles, which are neurotoxic, that were happening. So the outcome was that this supplementation prevented the formation of neurotoxic tangles of, hyper, of hyperphosphorate tau. And the next slide is to show you the quantification, because what I was showing you is a, is a, is a representative slide. Look at the rise by 18 months. These are the animals who have full-blown Alzheimer's, and look at the counterparts that received tributin. The hyperphosphate tau accumulation was almost completely blocked. What does this mean? Oh, oh, one more data point, which is very important. So if you look at the beginning, the, this supplementation prevents, it's a little bit technical, the deacetylation of histones that are required for active gene expression. So these animals here you see a lot more green, Okay, that starts dimming out on you. And that's because they're losing histone acetylation. What that also tells me, histone acetylation is controlling gene expression. So there are several gene functions that are being lost with age. And as you know, that's where they're also getting the disease, neurodegenerative. But look at the same animals that receive tributin. This loss was remarkably protected. That is telling us it's also protecting the genes from, from being uh, uh, diluted out or, or from being uh, inhibited over, over age. So what does this mean at the behavioral or cognitive end? So we first looked at the short-term memory assessment in these animals. It's called a novel object recognition test. You put the, uh, the mice, it's called habituation, and then you put them in the second cage where there are two objects, okay? And once they get habituated to those two objects, you remove one object and put a new one. So mice instinctively that are normal will go to the new object. That's called novel object recognition test. But animals that have started getting cognitive decline, they don't care much. They, they just, you know, it's, and then those patterns are tracked by camera. They're out here. These movements are, are tracked by camera, quantified, and the quantification is shown here. So this is the discrimination index, which means it tells me how much they're discriminating between the two objects. And again, there's a young animal, 10 to 12 months, and by the green, you, you see a, a, a robust decline in, in this discrimination index. And what you're seeing, that animals that got tributin from six months, they were able to preserve this function very nicely. And we saw this repeating in their preference index and also in the recognition index. So clearly animals that got tributin were able to prevent, or we were able to prevent the age-associated decline in the short-term memory. So this was a really exciting finding. Then we do what's called as a Y-maze test, is assessment of spatial memory and behavioral alternation. So it's a Y-maze. So initially the animals are allowed to go and they'll go travel through all the, these Y uh, uh, mazes that you have. And for the novel arm, you shut this novel arm down. And then they, they're allowed to move only in these two. But once you open this up, they preferably go to the novel arm that was opened up because that was not available to them. So as you can see here, that is good spatial memory. The mice remember, oh, that was not accessible. Now it goes there, preferentially. Whereas animals that have Alzheimer's, uh, they don't because it's the same. They, they cannot distinguish between a novel arm opening up. And same thing. As you can see, there's a big drop at 18 months, and clearly this 
drop in spatial memory or behavioral alternation was very significantly prevented. So these are very exciting findings. And again, let me again remind you what is connected with this is availability of butrate, availability of higher levels of beneficial bacteria, and a more diverse bacterial flora. So that started to prove causal connections because we are not giving this in the brain. We're giving tributin as an oral supplementation. So it's, it's affecting the microbiome and then it's affecting the gut-brain axis. Another very important part that it, it preserves age-associated decline in neuromuscular function. Falls, frailty, and fractures are a very significant component of aging. There, is, there, is, there are documented uh, uh, evidence for loss of neuromuscular function in, in, uh, associated with Alzheimer's. So this is a test where you put the animal on the grid, it grabs the grid, and you, you pull it, and it's recognizing the grip strength, how, how firmly it's grabbing. If you look again at the grip strength here in, in the quantification, there is a significant drop in the grip strength. But look at how we were able to preserve the grip strength or the neuromuscular function in these animals. So that's the grip force. That is the strength and is the force with which the animals are grabbing. So on both accounts, we saw a very significant improvement in the animals or, or preservation of neuromuscular function that got tributin from, from six months. And lastly, I'm going to show you that it prevents age-associated decline in motor coordination and activity. This is a rotor rod. The animals are kept here and it starts moving slowly. And we try and figure out how long the animal can hold on or fall off. As you can see, animals with Alzheimer's, they drop off very quickly, the rotor rod fall. But look at, again, the comparison with the tributin supplemented group. So this was very significant. Not only the, mem the memory part, but also the, the, the neuromuscular components were very significantly protected. And there's a lot of literature to show that gut bacteria and inflammation will affect your muscle strength and, and all kinds of things. So in conclusions, the gut microbial dysbiosis distinguished by a decrease in butyrogenic potential is a key pathogenic feature associated with the development of brain pathology relevant to Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis and disease progression. So this is a very significant finding. We have nailed down what are the specific events that need to be addressed. And importantly, the data provides a clinical rationale for targeting the gut dysbiosis mediated loss of butyrogenic potential for preventive and therapeutic strategies to preserve or even improve neurological function in Alzheimer's disease. And at the end, I want to uh, uh, basically in introduce our collaboration uh, at the Norton Neuros uh, Neuroscience Institute. And this is our research initiative that's about to begin. Um, the whole intent is to acquire fundamental knowledge about the pathogenic changes along the microbiota gut-brain axis and to apply that knowledge to reduce the, the burden of neurological disease, and to pursue longitudinal studies and randomized controlled clinical trials in well-defined patient cohorts that target the gut microbiome with a goal of developing novel preventative and therapeutic strategies. And I'm thankful for my collaboration with Dr. Shields and Dr. Cooper. We are really looking forward to bring all our knowledge base and, and bring it back to people. Lastly, uh, these are my collaborators at the University of Louisville. My other collaborators uh, are at the University of Florida and Miami. Um, there is a significant uh, Alzheimer's population that you're working with. Baylor College of Medicine, where we do all kinds of microbiome analysis. Vanderbilt um, uh, University, and now, as I just mentioned, Norton Neuroscience Institute. And finally, leave you with this, Hippocrates, is considered to be the father of modern medicine, said that all disease begins in the gut. A bad digestion, digestion is the root of all evil, and death resides in the bowel. Thank you very much for your time.